20 orcs. 20 orcs and 20 orcs. What you are looking at here are three different ways to represent a single unit of 20 orcs on the tabletop. On the left hand side of your screen, there are 20 15 millimeter orcs. These figures are proper pig faced fellas from Splintered Light. Let's get a good look at their leader here. Look at him. Handsome lad. Yeah, I went with a classic green skin look. It looks like he's missing a weapon, or maybe he's got a drink over there. As Splintered Light, these guys have the weapons molded in, and as you can see, oh, I bent my spear. I'm not going to unbend it, because you bend and unbend too often, it gets a little ugly. Over here in the center, we've got something a little bit different. This is a single stand of 20 orcs, excuse me, of four orcs. Now I've got five stands, each of which represents 20 orcs. I mean, it, it actually, re there's 12 orcs on there. Two millimeter figures from irregular miniatures, and you can see the six in front, there's five in the back, plus the standard bear. There's your 12 orcs that represent 20. But more commonly, guys will use four, and we can actually pull these off and go, hey, what if I put four fellas on a single base? Hey, look at that. Four 15 millimeter figures takes up the same amount of real estate as my single base of two millimeter figures. It's just that our figure ratio has changed. Likewise, this... 3x5 note card could contain a little miniature diorama, and when it comes time to play whatever your rule set du jour is, this card represents 20 orcs. It's important as wargamers that we understand the physical nature of our representation of a single unit of 20 orcs is just the, the geometry of of our physical representation changes the way we play the game. I have been playing Chainmail lately. The old standby from Gygax, Perrin, and Friends. Using 2mm figures, and that's probably why I'm thinking about this, and I think there's some valuable lessons here. It's something you should be thinking about in your wargaming as well. It doesn't matter what rule set you're using. The decision to use individual figures versus stands of figures, and it doesn't matter whether it's 4 or 20 figures, will change the nature of the game that you are playing. Not all 20 orcs are created equal. Now, setting aside for the moment that this 20 orcs and this 20 orcs and this 20 orcs may actually represent 400 orcs. If you're using a figure to you know, model ratio, a model to real-life orcs. Suppose, let's just imagine we are in the midst of, a, of an AD&D campaign uh, or any kind of fantasy role-playing campaign, and we are going to be doing a mass battle, and we have 400 orcs that are massed into a single unit. That's what you're looking at here at a 20 to 1 ratio. Perhaps we decide we're only going to use a ratio of 10 to 1. Each of these figures represents 10 orcs. Well, that means that my 4 to 1 ratio becomes a 40 to 1, and where we've got 4 orcs here representing 40 orcs in the game, here I've got one stand representing 40 orcs, and here I've got, well, oh, how, how do I represent that? That becomes a little bit awkward. And this is very similar to what we're looking at with your computer monitor or your TV. It's all about the resolution. What kind of resolution do you require? Perhaps you're playing a rule set where your 400 orcs, and I'm for the rest of this video, I'm just going to use 400 as our a 20 to 1 ratio. This 20 orcs represents 20 figures. These two guys are equivalent. My rule set might not need resolution at less than 20 orcs. I've got 20 orcs. I'm going to maintain. I've got a couple of uh, crossbow guys here that are that are holding up the uh, the, the note card. They're just helping. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate the. Appreciate the love. This may be your unit of maneuver. You may not care about such things as formations. Are they in line? Are they in column? Which way are they facing? We don't care. That's the case in one of my favorite rule sets, Neil Thomas's One Hour War Games. However, his rule set, you have to keep track of casualties. Every single block of troops has 15 hit points, and you can either use casualty markers or a roster over off board 
that you keep track of those. But the point is that that's the resolution we need. In a game like Chainmail, you may have different types of formations. In this case, I've got two lines of ten. I may want these guys marching in column, because if they're marching in column on a road, not the case in Chainmail, but it's the case in other games, if these guys are facing that way and they're in column, they get a movement bonus. So they're in 2 by 10. Or maybe I've got a couple of terrain features that are channeling these guys, and in order to get through that terrain feature, they have to go from... from you know, they just got to tighten up. Their frontage, this... The number of figures in the front row tells you what kind of dice to roll for when they're under attack. So when they find themselves in a situation where they're forced to condense down to, ah, we call it this in this case, six in the front, when they get into melee, they're only rolling six dice because there are only six guys that can get into contact with an enemy unit. That is important in a number of games. This resolution... This figure is one pixel in that kind of game where you're concerned with facing frontage with, in other block games, more army scale games, your resolution is only at, and your resolution, therefore your representation, is only like this. If you're playing a game like Chainmail and you decide, well, you know what, I don't want to have to paint up 20 figures every time I want to field a unit of orcs, which is the case for me, you may step down and say, well, you know what I'll do? I'll paint up five figures, and I'll use a four of my figures to represent... Oh, I'll use one of my figures to represent four of these figures, which means I need five of mine to represent 20 of yours. Let's take a look at what that means. Well, for starters, I am limited in the amount of formations that I can use. I can go with... Four in the front, but hey, look at that. My minimum depth for figures is two. I'm going to have two ranks. If each of these is four guys, there's no way I can condense, I can string these guys out. Right now, I've got a frontage of 10. I can't get to 20. That's something that may be worth considering. Likewise, I can never go more narrow than two, which may not be a problem. But at least I have the increased flexibility compared to a single base. I have the flexibility to put these guys in column. In fact, I can even tighten up the column to be a 2x2, two two, something like that. Perhaps this is an attack column, but I've got 4 in the front, 6 in the front. And this would be fairly common for the terrain on my tabletop. The other complexity, and we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, is that when you have a resolution of one unit with multiple hit points. Now, in Chainmail, each of these figures represents one hit point. As your, and this is where things get a little more complicated, as your unit, here, I'm going to set them back up in two, row, two ranks of ten. As this orc unit takes damage, two, four, six, eight, there we go, ten in the front. For every hit, you're going to remove a figure. So this guy's now dead. We're going to pull him off. Notice that as the unit takes casualties, take four, and then they take six, and then they take ten. Now, look what's happened. The frontage of my unit has been reduced by 50%, which means that as I take damage, I am seeing a reduction in the zone of control. There is a reduction in the real estate that, of the tabletop that this unit is able to influence. The, follow, the same is not true for the single stand, whatever, regiment, battalion. As this stand takes damage, it occupies the same amount of real estate that it did when the unit was fresh. That may be an important consideration. Likewise, playing chainmail with two millimeter figures on one inch bases, with one casualty, we throw down one casualty marker. With a second casualty, we throw down a second. It's not until I hit that fourth casualty. If these forces are five across the front, 
It's not until I take the fourth casualty that I lose any real estate. That may be important. There's another factor to consider. Because I have to remove a full stand of four, that reduces the amount of tactical options available to the player who is using this style of representation. Let me put my 15 millimeter orcs back into formation here. We once again have our 2x10, two 2x10 by ten. Two by ten ranks. And we'll zero in on our focus, lock it in place so we can show you something really interesting. Well, it, it is interesting. Now, bear in mind, the only tactical choice you have with, a, with this lineup, 2x10, is to remove, once you hit 4, off of one of your flanks. The player who is using 20 orcs in two ranks of 10 has another way to remove casualties. He may pick one casualty, two casualty, three casualty, four. That is the equivalent of removing one base. On the other hand, he may decide with my four casualties, I'm going to remove four off the back row, the exact same number of casualties, but notice that the frontage has not changed. If these two units are both fighting in parallel, the same unit lies in front of them, the 15 millimeter figures are able to continue to roll 10 dice because they've got 10 figures in contact. On the fourth injury, the fourth casualty, the two millimeter figure, the multi-figure bases don't have that option. They're still stuck at eight. Ten versus eight. The impact of the reduction in the size of the unit is gr felt to a greater extent by the two millimeter figures. These are all hypotheticals. The question then becomes, which is the right way to represent your troops on the tabletop? And the answer to that, as is so often the case, is, well, that depends. What are you hoping to model? What decisions do you want the player to make? There's no right and there's no wrong answer. The only wrong way to approach this situation and to choose between these three, and, and again, you know, it's worth pointing out, these are two ends of a spectrum. One that... You've got here, here you've got a resolution of one figure out of 20, and here you've got a resolution of all 20 figures. Here you've got a resolution of two of, of four, five stands of four. You could very easily have a situation where you've got two stands of 10. right? So and particularly if you've got 24 orcs, well man, you could have 12 stands of two, eight stands of three, three stands of eight. So there's a lot of different ways to, to handle this resolution. And the question is not what is the best way to, what is the best resolution to use on the tabletop. The question is which resolution is most appropriate for what we are trying to model. Alternatively, which resolution is the most fun to use, given that these are games and they're tactical games. But those are just two of the questions that have to be asked when you sit down to to ask to to determine how we want the rules to work. And it doesn't matter whether you're designing your own rules whole cloth or whether you are trying to shoehorn a mass battle game like Chainmail into your tiny little home where you don't have room for thousands of 15 millimeter figures. This is a case that is designed to hold photographs, four by six inches, and it holds half of a full army that would take a literal shelf load to hold with this. Chainmail is built from multiple unit actions. Multi-units. Four to five units on a side is going to provide about an hour-long game. This may be a more viable solution if you to, to this. But when you step down from this 20 figures to five figures, be aware of how that's going to influence and impact the game that you are playing. One more thought for today as we talk about this resolution. 
you are not locked in to either one of these situations. There are people who will sell, in fact, Litco sells them. They're called Sabbat bases. And if you want to be able to use your skirmishers, this these splintered light figures are sold in a, they're, act, they're actually marketed as a dungeon delving one shot, you know, go to town. You buy 24 of these in a package and they're actually, they're really made for um, perhaps role playing games or warband style rather than mass battle, right? You've got a mix of weapons here that, that does come with these two. I think it even comes with, yeah, it even comes with uh, a shaman as one of your 24, right? So that's more of a warband that you would use when you are dungeon delving. And I think it's actually marketed in their dungeon pack. He's got the magic rod, he's got the tusks, and he's got the, uh, he's, he's got the, anyway, there's your shaman, which doesn't do you a whole lot of good in a mass battle where, hey, but maybe you want to enjoy, you know, what's nice about these two millimeter figures is when I want to move all 20 figures, I can just pick them up and it, it's just that easy, right? It's just, the, the, I only got to move five figures, I can measure the first one and then bring them all up. Nice, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. If I want to move these 20 figures and they're all based individually, now I have to do 20 moves. Or I have to, as is so often, as you've seen in my videos, I just grab them and move them over. They've got plenty of protection. I'm not too stressed about getting these guys chipped or, or dinged. They are well used and well loved. However, the use of a Sabbat base that has little little indents where each of these figures are allows you to move the figures en masse with just, well, I mean, it's, it's a 3 by 5 card. If you have a sturdier base, you can, you can just pick up the whole base and move the entire unit in one shot. Very convenient, very nice. However, you need to give some thought, you need to give some consideration to the fact that as you remove your casualty markers, oh, move them from the front, you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute, these four slots are empty. Does that mean that only these guys or do I have to make sh are are in contact or do I have to make sure I'm only pulling guys from the rear? Well, once the figure once the unit gets reduced, you know, reduced not decimated, that would be 1 in 10. If it gets cut in half, well, I've still got the rest of this sabot base back here. If another unit wants to cross along behind, do these now 2 4 6 8 guys still exert the same zone of control and influence? over the area covered by the Sabbat base? Or do we now have to ignore that, that Sabbat? I don't know. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's only giving some thought to whether the answer that you use is appropriate for the battle. And I would also argue that one of the things that we struggle with in our society today is to understand that whatever is appropriate should be appropriate for everyone involved. And not, well, it's, you know, for, for my guys, my eight guys, they do exert that zone of control, but yours totally don't, because your guys are awful. Or if, if my guys do and your guys don't, you better have a good reason for that, right? Maybe, my, maybe your guys exert terror. Maybe there's some kind of horrific undead that even, you know, I, I don't know, or maybe because they're, it's their backsides, maybe they, didn't, maybe they didn't wash in the morning, or maybe they're, they're the D&D-style troglodytes that are pretty stinky. Uh, but you need to have an answer for that. You need to have a reason why the rules aren't being applied, uh, aren't being applied consistently. So there's your little 20-minute video on representation and base sizes and thoughts on wargaming. We're thinking about this a little too deep, maybe. I don't know. I don't think it's too deep. I like to overanalyze things. That's what wargamers do. We like to get in and we like to understand things. On a, on a visceral level. And hopefully today's little video has helped you think about things in a way you may not have in the past. The progenitors of modern day wargaming analyzed all of this stuff. Uh, I would highly recommend you go back and read some of the early books from the late 1960s and early 1970s. Heck, I'm playing Chainmail. This was originally published in 1971, originally? It was 1973, and it's got a lot to say and a lot of things that we take for granted, things that were were hashed out 50 years ago, 
are still worth thinking about today. It's still worth understanding the DNA of this wonderful hobby of ours so that when we make our own individual decisions, we're making them with a sense of full enlightenment and understanding all of the ramifications of those little decisions. I think that about does it. This is Mr. Wargaming coming to you from the House of Wargaming. And remember, until next time, I'm praying for you.